Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, welcome and thank you for joining us tonight to this uh, embarrassingly holistic conversation about the future with the title, The World in 2020. We have two truly honorable guests for this occasion, uh, two very special guests. I would like to introduce you uh, straight out from the Hill Country of Texas, the chairman and founder of Geopolitical Futures, one of the foremost workshops of geopolitical analysis in the world, George Friedman, and also from Budapest, my friend Balázs Orban, who is one of the youngest members of the Hungarian government and also State Secretary of the Prime Minister's Office. Please welcome our guests, Balázs and George. Hi, guys. Hi, good evening, everybody. And just to tell you, dear audience, a little secret, both of our guests were actually born in our beautiful capital, Budapest. Uh, even if George likes to keep it a secret how well he still speaks our language. So we have three Hungarians here uh, talking global issues. And um, let me start with a very short question. Uh, what was the most surprising news or development in the last couple of weeks that but but surprised you the most during the coronavirus crisis? Well, from a personal standpoint, I published a book on the United States on February 25th and the publicity was all laid out and everything was there and suddenly it disappeared. The publicity, the book, everything. So you were, it was a very surprising event for me not to, uh, the book was invisible. Uh, on the personal level, I was very surprised by how disciplined the Americans were for a short period of time. Hmm that they imposed in a country of 330 million, a very se severe discipline and how united the country actually was. Yes, the Democrats and Republicans, of course, had their fun, but we were united. Now it's breaking apart. Now it's there are people saying enough, but I was very surprised by how my country uh, responded, which is normally it's chaos, but not this time. Even not in New York or big cities? Well, New York has always has an enormous problem. It is a very small area with a huge population. And it normally is impossible to manage. I grew up there, okay? Plus, it's the only place where European cameramen like to go because they don't want to go out to see the country. So the image of what's going on in the United States is always the one idiosyncratic place. New York City, which is not like any other city that we have. And so it looked chaotic there, but I walked into New York a year ago and I'd show you chaos. It's the way it looks. So it was a very bad time in New York. I mean, they, they had serious problems and diseases and so on, but it was not emblematic of the United States. Balaj? Two things came into my mind immediately. One is that it was very surprising me how different country, how differently countries reacted on this uh, uh, crisis based on their general attitude or, or mindset. How and how different the, the general national mindset of different uh, uh, countries are. I mean, you know, Sweden followed the strategy where they said we don't need any lockdown. They convinced all the people that they don't need the lockdown, so the country remained open. Um, we Hungarians immediately, immediately made the decision to lock down, to stay at home. A crisis is coming from, uh, a threat is coming from outside, and we have to defend ourselves, so everybody should be patient and stay at home. The United States uh, follow the different strategy, uh, China and um, and the, uh, and the out more autocratic Asian uh, countries. They they immediately went to another direction. So different countries were were choosing different uh, strategies, and and all the strategies were were based on the national mindset of 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 that country and how important it is and. Uh, during the time of peace, I mean peace, we don't talk about it too much. So it was very surprising me how 
how how visibly these differences are there, although we are always talking about globalization and the unification of the world. And the second thing is that <laughs> how politics remain remain important during this crisis as well. So I thought that, um, for example, in the case of Hungary, that uh, no one will accuse Hungary on what strategy we choose, uh, because everybody and every country and we, every international environment, I, I mean, every international community member, we focus on on uh, protecting uh, the people and protecting the country. So I thought that they will not have time to to criticize from a political perspective um, other countries or other politicians or turn and formulate this uh, crisis into a political uh, crisis as well. But it happened immediately. And what you see is that in every country, uh, the same thing is happening. So the opposition is using um, this virus uh, to attack the governments. The governments, they try to collect the confidence uh, and, and strengthen the confidence in the governmental institutions and so on and so on. So what we have to understand is that polit politics and political thinking is still very important. And uh, in the time of uh, big crisis, um, it's still very important to to calculate with them with mm -hmm. that. So, guys, we are here to discuss and talk winners and losers of the coronavirus crisis, which is a very exciting topic in my opinion. And I'm curious about if we can agree on the winners and losers side of this last couple of months period. Let's start with big technology companies. Big tech seems to be an eminent winner of the whole. COVID crisis as online retailers, social media platforms, as well as data acquisition efforts by them are actually thriving. Has the control of these giants just became even less likely, uh, in your opinion? Well, I, I, I'd have to argue that these are very small companies. Given the size of the American economy, Google is a cute little company. Uh, we, we don't have dominant companies. We don't have a... Uh, a, a German uh, Mercedes company. So one thing we have to understand firstly, we we don't know what is going to happen economically. But the really large industries in all of our countries is construction, transportation, agriculture, and this employs the people and so on, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, we're fascinated by the emerging companies, these and they are large, but not compared to, for example, the American economy. So the real question that we're facing here is first, how did the, everybody handle it? The well, first thing, everybody had to have a metaphor. We have never seen something like this on a global basis. We did not understand the danger. We did not understand whether there's a solution. We still don't. So each country took the first step. And to us, the most fascinating first step was the abolition of Shenzhen. The Shenzhen zone disappeared. The, bo the borders of Europe went up. The borders of everyone went up. But the Europeans are not supposed to have borders. So this was interesting because Europe is one of the foundations of the international economy. And it began to behave unpredictably. Um, the United States had only one metaphor for what was going on, war. We understand war, so we went into, and the president took the War Powers Act, which was not dissimilar to what uh, Prime Minister Orban in, in included, and he used that because no country had instruments for this. So we understand how to handle a nuclear war. Got it. <laughs> Haven't had one, but we're ready. We understand how to handle a local war. How do you handle a war in which there is no enemy you can fight? How do you organize the people? How do you get it about? So, you know, when we talk about, Balas is speaking about the different approaches of countries. We all have metaphors, legends of 
who we are and what we are and what we do. The Americans immediately went to war. They didn't really go to war, but that was their meta. And the president said, I'm a wartime president. So everybody said, okay, I understand. We're at war. Uh, the Russians immediately went into lying, <laughs> denying that anything was happening. The Chinese declared that they were world superpower now. Uh, we all did what we like to do, okay? But here's the truth. At this point, we don't know the reality because we don't know what the economic consequences are going to be. And in the case of Europe, we don't know what will happen to the EU after this event. Now, the EU's natural policy on anything is nothing happened. We locked down the borders. We didn't let anybody in. We didn't let them out, but nothing happened. Don't worry. Um, this is the European approach. We are all hunting for this, and we have a problem, which I will say which is not popular. The medical establishment failed. It was not ready to deal with an unknown crisis on an emergency basis. Here, time counted. Here, they needed solutions early, or at least definitions of what the threat was and everything else. And they weren't built for that. The research organizations were built for scrupulous, uh, careful uh, process. We didn't have the leisure for it. So they will eventually find a solution. But the when is crucial from an economic point of view. But George, st still, uh, in your opinion, are the technology companies, the data-based companies, are winners in this situation, generally speaking, regardless how big are they? To which the answer not? is, if we have a depression, what have you won? <laughs> You know, I, the before this virus, a very interesting question Hello. was before this crisis, a very interesting question was what would be uh, the political consequence in the United States to Facebook and Twitter and the others? All right, there is a, a serious question. Um, the question now is what does the customer base look like? In other words, they live on advertising. So the idea that they can exist if other companies are not able to advertise or are not only there is not impossible. So what are these tech companies? These aren't tech companies. These are advertising agencies. They make their money off of other companies' ability to advertise. So if the public can't buy or if these companies don't exist, Facebook's revenue collapses. So we need to distinguish between the technology and the business they're in. Okay. Balazs, are you with us? Uh, yes, I had some problems with the connection, but uh, I think I'm back. So at least I hope. I'm curious um, about uh, 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 your opinion, whether the big technology companies who are also very active and uh, dominant uh, in our little country are winners or losers of this situation. I don't want to give you an analytical answer because I'm emotionally touched. So you will get the personal answer. Uh, it's based only, on my, based only on my conservative opinion. The truth is I'm currently fed up with online platforms, fed up with uh, social media, fed up with online uh, education, what we have here in Hungary, because it's so difficult and it uh, it is so much worse than uh, the normal type of life. When you have uh, personal relations, when you have person-to-person uh, -person education, when you have a real life. So compare your real life with your online uh, life, the real life is much better. And, uh, and that's a very um, new experience uh, for our generation and for the young, young people. So I can't wait to go as offline as it is, is possible. So from my, my personal attitude, I think that, uh, that uh, the big technological companies are not, uh, not happy with, uh, with the current result, that it turned out that you cannot transport your life into an online platform because uh, because it's it's worse than than the real life. 
Fair enough. Uh, for the audience, uh, I would like to share that, as always, we are more than open for your questions. Please put the questions on the Facebook feed so we can put them to the speakers. Uh, George, we had a very interesting conversation, correspondence during the crisis. Uh, when you wrote me that this is the end, this is the beginning of the end for the European Union. After a few weeks time, you still agree with your opinion, your statements, or things are changing? Well, now this European Central Court has overruled the Germans. It's one thing to overrule the Hungarians, it's another thing to overrule Lithuanians, but when you overrule the Germans, now you've made a claim on the part of the bureaucracy that cannot be sustained and will not be sustained. Look, you do not have a common interest. The EU was created for peace and prosperity. They did not think through how to handle war and a depression. They did not understand that being this entity meant you shared, that the weakest one had the biggest claim on the system, right? They didn't understand that if you're going to have one currency, this currency has got to support the broad breadth of this. We have to remember Europe is, after Australia, the smallest continent in the world with some 50 countries that are sovereign. The EU is merely a treaty organization. It's just a treaty. It's a treaty pretending to be an empire. And the, the rules of Maastricht are so poorly drawn. It was such a bad document that the fundamental question of where does power lay and how was it organized? It was never addressed. We Everybody assumed that the Cold War is over, so now we will go ahead and everything will be perfect. Well, here you have the ultimate problem. Germany is a compulsive exporter. It exports 50% of its GDP. It needs one sort of currency. Italy is a compulsive borrower, and not payer backer sometimes. Okay. Uh, you have Hungary, which is a small, dependent country on exports, yet working to try to create a domestic economy that can sustain itself. To try to do what you've done can't work. The United States didn't try to do this in North America. It has only three countries. We don't tell the Mexicans how to run their schools. We don't want to even think about it. Uh, the Canadians don't tell us what the rule of law is. All right? We trade. This is a trading block, nothing else. The, e, the, the, the European community was an excellent organization. But the idea that you were going to create an integrated nation state out of 15 Haitians, or however you include 26, and that this was going to be coherent, it's childish. Now what you have is a bureaucracy whose legitimacy doesn't exist because it was not elected by anyone. The nations were elected by someone. They got in there because some bizarre process of various me methods, the countries agreed. In this crisis, the prime minister of Hungary is responsible for Hungary by law, by tradition, by every principle. Who are the bureaucrats that the EU responsible for? Well, I mean, I have been saying for a long time, as you know, that the EU is uh, calamity. And not because I don't want because I don't want to see a strong Europe. You know, the idea is the Americans are afraid of the Europeans. We're not afraid. We want to trade with you. Nobody scares us. That's our problem. Uh, so the thing here is, this is the test. This is a crisis. The EU and Secretariat wants to claim authority over its management, but doesn't understand that Italy is not Germany. They I guess they don't travel or something. I don't know. And this crisis is going to rip it apart because the prime minister of Poland or of Italy or whatever has to make decisions. He has to make decisions. And the EU's solution is to have a meeting. And 
the, the timelines don't mesh. So I have to say, I think there will always be a European Union because I think in Europe, the League of Nations still has an office somewhere in Geneva with two old ladies, you know, doing it. Multinational organizations do not die in Europe. But the idea that the prime minister of Italy answerable to the Italian people can exist under the current situation of the European Central Bank. Well, that's not going to happen. So. Bias, you have a European flag behind of you, so don't don't forget that you have to be the, the, the good cop now. I, I have I, I knew that uh, compared to George, I have to be the more optimistic about the future of Europe, which is actually a very uh, strange situation for us Hungarians because here in our community we are the bad guys who like to say the things what is what are said by by uh, by George. Um, I think that there is an ongoing and never ending debate. Uh, which was always there and it's still there about the future of, uh, of the European Union. And there are different uh, answers and or positions in this debate. And, uh, and it was so in the 15s when the, when the cooperation started. So one group of people were saying that uh, uh, this um, experiment should be uh, finished uh, by the European... Uh, uh, super state, which is led by bureaucrats and and controlled from uh, Brussels, but at the beginning there were there were also other group of people who were saying that uh, that we have to trade with e with each other, we have to respect national sovereignty and the freedom of independent nations of of um, of European uh, people, and we have to create a platform where we can and have to cooperate. And these two different strategies, these two drift, very different um, um, attitudes were there from the very first moment. Uh, it's, it's part of the European, it's part of the history of, of European integration. The problem, I think, according to my view, is not with that two different strategy or with the competition between the two different strategies. But the problem is, that in this, in 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 the last uh, decades, uh, one strategy became very dominant, and it was backed by all the European uh, European institutions. So the strategy that we should transform our European continent into a European superstate, and we should not focus on the different interests different cultural, historical backgrounds of the of the nations of the European uh, people. This strategy and this general attitude became very popular, and especially in Brussels, where the bureaucrats and where the EU institution leaders uh, were sitting. So th they became the catalyzing uh, factor of, of, uh, of uh, this thing and not the neutral, balanced type of uh, bureaucrats, what was their original attitude back in 70s or or 60s or 80s so that's uh, according to my view uh, that's the most uh, important problem currently but reality always hits back and we learned during uh, the crisis of uh, the migration issue and during this coronavirus crisis as well that as george mentioned it eu is not a country EU is not a dominant force. Those are the nations and the representative of that nations who are responsible for their people. And obviously they share some responsibility about the continent. So the, so the task is not that we should transform all the, con all the power from, from the nation states towards Brussels, but the, but the, but the task is that we have to understand each other, we have to understand the differences, and we have to analyze and understand in which areas we can cooperate, and where are the areas where we cannot cooperate because we are so different. So imagine the situation and that I try to convince uh, uh, a Swedish politician that uh, mass migration is not good for the country. 
And he is trying to convince me that mass migration is good for all the countries. So these are fundamental differences. We cannot convince each other. But the thing is that we don't have to convince each other. So we just have to live peacefully together and work peacefully together and accept the differences. And uh, that's the thing what uh, what is missing sometimes. The problem is that in, in these, uh, in these um, very hard situations, when grassroots uh, voters all around Europe see that uh, that uh, solution is not coming from Brussels, only uh, their only goal is to increase tensions uh, against countries. Ursula von der Leyen uh, uh, said that oh, we are sorry, but we didn't focus on uh, Italy. During the crisis, the European Parliament was not... Uh, focusing on on the fight against the coronavirus but they were focusing on the political uh, witch hunt against uh, the central eastern european countries so it's it's a problem because it undermines the trust between the nation states and it it is undermining the trust of the grassroots european voters in um in 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 the European uh, institutions, so we have to stop it immediately, and that's our interest. Because what George mentioned is that we are uh, small, um, export-oriented, uh, open uh, uh, country from an economic perspective. So the achievement of the European uh, Union, they are very important for us. So we're constantly working on, on, um, on, on maintaining the current level of communication and the current, increasing the current level of, uh, of trust between the nation states. But uh, sometimes those are the bureaucrats and the Brussels institutions, which, which makes it uh, very hard to do so. So guys, we got many, many interesting questions. Thank you so much for the audience. And one of them is uh, especially fits to this context uh, from uh, Anna Mori Ishki. Uh, she's asking about the distinction between experts and politicians, which is a very fashionable thing here in Europe, also in the US, I think. Uh, she's asking who experts or politicians are handling the crisis better, in your opinion? What, what is the distinction during the coronavirus crisis? And what do you think about their role and their weight in the future after this period? So, the problem with experts is they know one thing very well, but they don't know who is the next thing over. So the expert said the best way to handle this crisis is by sequestration, staying home. He didn't think about the economy that the consequence of pulling the workforce out of the economy is going to have significant effects. The virtue of a politician is that he's forced to deal with large coalitions of people. He doesn't have the luxury of focusing on one thing. And therefore, they are superior managers to experts. Experts are necessary. They, you know, they know things that are, are indispensable. But the man or woman who is elected has a tensile feeling for his country, what it can tolerate, what it will cost, what it can bear, that is indispensable. And one of the things I was going to say before is that the foundation of liberal democracy is national self-determination. And self-determination comes from an elected official and that official's virtue is that he got elected and that he had to pay the price for that and understand all the others. Expertise can be very helpful when controlled and managed. And this is the fight we see in the United States now. Donald Trump, for, uh, an interesting man under any circumstances, basically doesn't trust experts. It's not that he doesn't believe them or anything like that. But he's, his view is that they don't understand what they're doing, what the consequences are. The Democrats are the party of the technocracy. They are the ones who believe that the management of the political system should come from experts. 
Trump believes it should come from an understanding of the public, of what they can tolerate. So there's a, it's not framed that way that clearly, but it really is what's happening. So the question you've asked is fundamental to the future of a liberal democracy. The difference between technocratic rule and elected rule is the difference between the imposition of solutions and the negotiation of solutions between the state and the people so that it can be sustained. Yet you can get things done faster and smarter in some senses, but in your country, which is a more homogeneous country than the United States, okay, in the United States, you have better be ready to understand that Oregon does not want what Florida wants and bridge that gap. Balash, on the expertise issue. Uh, yeah. Um, so the thing is, every country, and especially the case in Hungary, that uh, being positive with politicians is not a very popular standpoint. Uh, but uh, during the time of crisis, I think it turned out that it makes sense to have politicians, to have a uh, representative uh, uh, government, because they are the only ones who can make a decision. And it is a personal experience on my, on, on my hand, because I was, sometimes I was there when, when the political decisions were made, how to handle the, the um, uh, uh, consequences of the crisis. And it wasn't, it, it wasn't a very easy job to hear all the experts' opinion. There was one expert who was, a, who was a doctor or a virologist, and he was saying one thing. And there was another expert who was an economist, and he was saying another thing. And there was a third expert who was a law enforcement uh, official, and he was saying a very different thing. So, so, so as George mentioned it, experts, only experts of one field of uh, very narrow field of um, of uh, science and uh, political de that's not how political decisions should be made and you as a politician should be the one who has to not only listen to the voice of the experts but listen to the voice of the people and the differences as i mentioned at the beginning be between the nations are very important and uh, you cannot um, cannot uh, simply cannot uh, calculate with that on a scientific uh, uh, perspective you have to feel the you have to understand your people all the politicians right. should understand uh, the people the scientific truth is a nation consists of diverse people if you do not begin understanding that you're either a dictator or incompetent so exactly. the prime minister, the president is a creation of the public. He speaks to the public. He gets validation from the public and he doesn't have the right to decide what we should all do is dress in blue from now on because that'd be good. Um, it's important to understand what politics is. Aristotle said man is a political animal. The problem I find with <clears throat> many thinkers today is they find saying it's political as kind of a corruption rather than the highest moments of uh, public life. That's true. So according to my view, age of politician is back, uh, especially during the time of crisis. And that was the case in the ancient Roman Empire as well. Uh, when the barbarians were at the borders, that all the people uh, knew that they need politicians who can take the lead. So. Nothing new under the sun, but uh, in our age, it's um, in in my age, it's um, it's a brand new experience. When Franklin Roosevelt, right after he took office during the Great Depression, made a speech, he said, "We have nothing to fear but fear itself." And it doesn't make sense until you think about it. Okay, the job of the president is to give the public a sense that someone understands that someone cares and someone will do something. Dr. Fauci, which I don't know in Europe, if you, you get to see, he's quite an experience, will sit down in the morning and say, we don't know what caused it. We don't know how it spreads. We're not going to have a vaccine for years. 
this is the only thing you can do. And pr President Trump already is going crazy. This is the last message that he wants to deliver because a politician understands the most important thing. Sometimes you must lie. <laughs> Sometimes you cannot tell the truth and manage the country. And an expert regards a lie. You know, Plato spoke of the noble lie, and I think a good politician uh, exercised that. Well, I, I see it in a in a bit different way because uh, it's not. I think I think the most important point is not trying to differentiate between telling the truth or telling telling some lie. But but the thing is that you have to maintain the trust between you, I mean, the one who is in charge or the political elite who is in charge and the people. And but you can't, but you, but you okay. have to maintain, maintain the trust, which is a two sided issue from one side. You have to understand what the people want. And on the other side, you have to. Um, have your own opinion and strategy, and you have to mix the two things and find a, a good balance. And this yes. good balance is different in every every case. In this particular case, to tell a world that it is terrified of dying, we have no solution. Go home and don't come out. Is not necessarily the wisest thing. A noble lie is not a lie. It skirts things around and comes out telling them that there are things that are happening and so on and so forth. Because the president's job, the prime minister's job, is to hold the country together, to make it continue to function even under extreme stress, and to make them understand that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And somehow you have to ameliorate it. So... I think the politician is infinitely more sophisticated hmm. than the experts. Yeah, that's true. But uh, but the, that's the American perspective, what you mentioned. We Hungarians, we did it a bit differently because uh, immediately the prime minister uh, told uh, the public that uh, we have a, a virus, or we what what which came from outside. We don't have a, a solution. We don't have a vaccine. So the only thing what we can do is that we go to a lockdown. We close the country. Everybody should be prepared. Everybody should stay home. Please act responsibility. And we prepare whole, the, our healthcare system. And, uh, and after that, if it turns out that this strategy works, we can discuss whether we should reopen the country or not. And it and it happened. And and people people were agreed with that strategy, and people followed this strategy, not because it was forced by the authorities, but also voluntarily. And now, during the time when we have manu, I mean, we have space to think about how to reopen. Uh, the country and how to rebuild our economy. Everybody accepts it. So, uh, so every country and every that's, every attitude uh, is different. That's the key. You're Hungarian. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So we begin with the fact that you're Hungarian, and I live in the United States, and we're different countries. And if there was one entity that tried to harmonize these two countries, there'd be chaos. No, and no, yeah, yeah. The American president is ruling a different country than Hungary. So let's just let's yeah. let's talk about the US a little bit more because many questions are coming in about the US China collision course. Uh, Richard Stromness is asking whether the United States or China will win this situation uh, in the midterm or in the long term. So let's coming back to the losers and winners question. And George, please explain what do you think? China's GDP is $14 trillion. The American GDP is $22 trillion. We are order of magnitude different size. They have a, a well over a billion people population. We have 330 million. So we are very different countries. Uh, China built an industrial plant too big for Chinese consumption. They must export. Okay. Their biggest customer is the United States. 
Now, one of the things that you learn in business, I'm not a good businessman, but I learned this, is never start a fist fight with your best customer. It's not, it's not a good thing to do. Uh, China derives 5% of its GDP, conservatively, from its trade with the United States. The United States derives less than one half of 1% of its GDP from trade with China. So beginning a battle with the United States from an economic standpoint is a losing proposition. The Chinese economy was built by the United States in two ways. First, American investment built the supply chain that's giving us the problem now. And secondly, and more importantly, um, we buy most of their products. The important thing about the United States is it is the largest importer in the world. The one, that, the largest for Germany, the largest for China, for everyone. This means that it's a very bad idea to get us mad at them. You don't do that. The head, uh, the, the primary job of the Chinese president is to keep the American president under control. He did it with Obama. He did it with Bush. You don't control Donald Trump. This, this is the, the message to the world. And Trump said, we don't have access to the Chinese economy. And before the virus, he slammed sanctions. He slammed the tariffs on China. Okay. This is in our national right to do. Um, the Chinese then had this virus. We still don't know how badly it was struck, uh, but they had a terrible time in Wuhan. At the same, you know, same time as this was happening, they had uprising in Hong Kong. Okay. And it was revealed that they were running concentration camp for the Uyghurs in Xinjiang province. So it's not been a bad, a good year for them. It's not been a good year for us. Economically, they are dependent on us. We're their customers. Um, militarily, there's no comparison. They cannot be a global power because they have no fleet in the, in the Atlantic. They can't land troops in the Balkans and so on. So it's, it's silly to speak of them that way. They're a very important country. We have a relationship. It was in the process of being uh, renegotiated. When the crisis broke down, we found that much of our dependency was on China for uh, pharmaceuticals. And it was a problem. So we have shifted a great deal of it already to India and some of it back to the United States, but we want to control the price and that does it. The idea has come that we're in competition with China. I mean, what are we going to win? Well, what is the United States winning in this competition? What are we holding on to? So what we have here is a rising power far behind the United States economically and militarily. We have a mutual crisis. We are accusing the Chinese of starting the disease. They have to answer. And so the answer is we will pass you by very shortly. Well, the numbers say they're not passing us by anytime soon. And we will try. But the problem that China has is that it elected President Xi, not because he's a Marxist, not because he was a good dresser. They elected him as competent. He was the Chinese equivalent of a technocrat. His failure to manage its relationship with the United States, his failure to manage the Hong Kong situation, his failure to manage the, cri the, the viral crisis, all raise questions about his ability and the ability of the Central Committee to manage China. So I would say that the American goal is please ship us our damn medicine and please leave this alone. We have our own problems. And we don't even understand what this claim is, but the Chinese are very good at one business, propaganda. But as you are a politician in office, should, should I push you into the situation to, to, to bet either on China or the US? No, you definitely shouldn't do that. But I want to react on, on what, um, what Yuri Baichi uh, said. Uh, I have a feeling from from here. So Ju from Ju Ju Judy Bachi. Yeah, yeah. Ju <laughs> we had we had a long personal history. And no, no, no. I, that's I old George. George. You say that to somebody old. <laughs> I'm, I'm not old. Okay. <laughs> so, so what 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 Judy said is that um, George is timeless. Actually, I can confirm. Okay. 
Okay, I try to be more strict on on that issue. Um, <laughs> the the thing is, I have a feeling from from here from Budapest that the American elite is uh, divided. So the problem oh, is, uh, so the pro yeah, but uh, uh, currently is uh, probably it it is a bigger problem. So so China. China, pol China political elite is, is not divided on the strategy, but the American uh, political elite is, is divided on what the biggest challenge of the United States will be in the 21st century. So there are some, some people in the United States who are saying that in the 21st century, for us, the biggest threat will be still Russia. There are the group of people who are saying that the biggest threat for the United States of America and for the dominance of, of uh, this country will be uh, Islam and radical religious type of uh, radicalization form of Islam. And there are a certain group of people who are saying that the biggest threat in the 21st century will be China. So we are the dominant power and they are the rising power. And the problem is that that they cannot make a decision which direction should uh, should they turn, and it is uh, causing um, serious tensions all over the world. Obviously, um, what we've seen in um, in the last years since we have President Trump in the Oval Office is how it looks like when there is. Uh, trade war and the virus war between the dominant power and the rising power. So that's a brand new experience for us, who are the small animals uh, in the same room with these big animals. So it's a it's a brand new experience for us, um, and and we are very curious what we happen with because it affects all every people on this planet. As as you know or may know, the U.S. has adopted a new military strategy, a very important one. We have withdrawn almost all of our forces from Iraq last week. We pulled Patriot missiles out of Saudi Arabia. And the other things have happened where basically the United States is saying we don't really have an interest. With the price of oil what it is, the historic interest is the British of controlling the oil fields. We have plenty in Texas. Don't worry about it. The goal is to deal with the Russians and the Chinese. It's a completely different military problem. To deal with Russia and China is to have the relationship we have with Poland, the relationship we have with Romania. It is primarily a land problem. The Chinese problem is primarily a naval problem compounded by air forces. So China has been demanding that we leave the South China Sea for 10 years. They've been threatening and so on. They have failed to make any progress there. Their Navy is untested. Their Navy has never fought a complex air land battle. They are working toward that. At this point, they have two aircraft carriers. We have 13. Uh, so my answer is, yeah, they can be a rising power, but it takes a long time to rise. The United States took a century to rise to challenge Britain. And so the, the answer is this. The American elite, whom I don't know who they are, because I've not, not met them. I guess I don't get to go to the club. Uh, you know, the, the view of the Americans about China is we're angry at them. We're angry at them because they lied about the virus, taking away time where we can... But we're not going to do anything. The very thing to remember is that, for example, in the case of Europe, we were the happiest people of all to see Europe surge economically. We could do business with you. You could be strong. You didn't need our help and so on. The idea that we are threatened by strong economic powers, it gives us trade opportunities and things like that. The military question is a different one. And the military question is, at this point, China has no ability to be a global military power. It is not even in control of the waters off its own coast. Okay? Russia, it, you know, who knows 
under the pressure of no of very low oil prices what calculus a putin makes and you are right on the front line if he decides to do something but we don't think he is there's no indication that he is able to mount a serious attack so from the american point of view we're not in competition there are very few things that can threaten us our biggest problem is internal our mm-hmm. biggest problem is organizing the united states in a transitional period where the old industries have declined new industries like tech have risen and large numbers of people are alienated from that the united states is very inward now this is one of those periods that it has sometimes where it has to reorganize itself so you know this is like a wrestling match where people go to the wrestling match and they wait to see the two big guys wrestle but we're not showing up we have, um, we, have, we have a pretty interesting simple but very interesting question here from Christoph who asks do you think that the EU will have to cho- choice between choose between uh, the US and China and by the EU let's mean here uh, Europe uh, in general and European countries I think it it gets back to the to the technological question as well because of the 5G issue and Huawei issue so is it that simple the question itself and what is the answer I would put it this way if Germany doesn't want to sell cars to the United States they can sell it to China we don't care we are a net importer okay we're not an exporter we don't depend heavily on any market to buy our goods and what we have learned in the world is that people will happily sell us the things we pay so for us the idea is why choose between europe and china then and um the united states china trades with both it's active in in europe we've never shown any concern over it you are in a different position when you're an importer than when you're an exporter when you're an exporter you are trying to manage the behavior of all of your customers all of the people who buy from you and hold on to your market or importer you feel far less vulnerable but that really is the crucial difference when you are the largest importer of goods in the world you tend not to be frightened well i i think that um, that it's a not it's not a good question for us for europeans so because uh, you cannot get um, a, a good answer on that um from a military perspective uh, the thing is quite uh, uh, simple almost every european country is a member of uh, nato so military we are aligned with the united states of america and that's good that we have uh, nato and we have the united states of america on our side uh, but fr- from an economic perspective i think that the uh, european union shouldn't choose between any of the big player we should our interest is to have trade to have economic uh, cooperation with all the big players all around the world it doesn't matter whether it's russia it's uh, it's china it's um, it's uh, a, a big player from uh, uh, south america or other countries we should be we should be open uh, to everybody and what we understand is that a hidden war is a hidden trade war is going on so there are some big players who are trying to convince us that we should turn towards them and not uh, the others and everybody is doing that but uh, but we europeans we shouldn't listen uh, to these voices we should follow our interest and my problem is that what we see from brussels uh, is that they the european institutions and the brussels institutions they are not strong enough to identify very clearly the european interest what george mentioned the germany can identify the german interest hungary and the hungarian uh, government can identify the hungarian interest spanish uh, the government of spain can identify the spanish interest but uh, but i'm not sure that Brussels institutions have the capability of 
clearly identifying and representing the general European um, uh, interest on, on, on trade. So that's a problem because we are affected by others. I would say only this. In a trade war, you're not given a choice which way to go. In this particular case, you have two customers coming to you wanting to do business. Pick one, pick the other. You're not in a compulsion, so it's not a war. There's, we'll also always give you a better price, and we may say, well, we won't sell you this if you do that, but we, will, we, we understand that. It's very important to understand that, and there is this kind of un vision that the United States has a compulsive desire to dominate the economic landscape. We had an issue with China. China was given free trade access to the United States, accepted free trade access on the other side, but broke it, but didn't keep its word, didn't let our goods in. This was a, now China couldn't afford to let our goods in because then it would be competitive. But beyond those matters, I think one of the things that the Europeans have to understand is how little we care about Europe how little we care about Japan, how little we care about, we're a very large country. We live in a large island, North America. We have Canada to the north, which is, I can't even say this, but that's us. And we have Mexico to the south. <laughs> they're, they're us too in a different way. We have a larger free trade zone than the EU. The, the, the collective GDP of mm -hmm. those three nations is larger than the collective of EU, and uh, we have a larger population, and we have two oceans on either side of us. So when we and we control those oceans, the thing to understand about the United States, and there's always exceptions and people like that, is we're institutionally isolationist. We're not isolationist because we don't trust the world; we just don't need much. The China confrontation was simply. We were ticked off with the Chinese. The difference in change was going to make any difference. What we have to really understand, given that the United States is, a, is, when I go to Europe, the breathtaking misunderstanding of the United States, of what it wants, what it worries about, what its issues are, is really amazing. On NATO, I want to simply say this. Um, we really support NATO, and we would like the rest of Europe to join. Because at this point, you're going to the meetings, you're drinking the wine, you're enjoying everything, but you don't have an army. Now, there's a secret <laughs> behind a military alliance. You can't be in one if you don't have a military. So the idea here of the Europeans is that you're going to be guaranteed your security by the United States while you spend your money going on vacation. Well... That's going to end. That really is. It's going to end because... No, I think it's already happened. That was the biggest um, <laughs> yeah. biggest uh, uh, stone which was thrown in by uh, President Trump. And what he did, it was very important. And we Hungarians were saying it uh, for years, although in the past we also didn't have the money to, to, to increase our military capacities. But it, it's happening now. And I'm, uh, we Hungarians are very... Uh, very happy with what uh, President Trump uh, uh, did because he opened the eyes of the Europeans, all the European countries, that they should uh, focus on uh, the military again because we cannot depend on America all the time. So it's but, uh, it's one very important positive uh, message what we got from uh, President Trump immediately after. From our point of view, there's only two countries in Europe that we care about militarily, Poland and Romania. We would like Hungary to be with another one of those. Let us know when. This is, I think this is the perfect occasion to move on to our last topic. We have a few minutes left, uh, which is, of course, Hungary. Uh, during the crisis, Hungary was attacked once again because of its political leadership. Uh, without going into the details of those debated laws and decisions this time, how would you define the interest of this mid-size Central European country in this global turbulent geopolitical landscape? Well, firstly, it's very important to recognize that Prime Minister Orban did nothing that every other country didn't do. In the case of the United States, we invoked war powers. 
as his justification. In other countries, they simply imposed their will without any justification. So it's enormous hypocrisy by the rest of the Europeans to criticize this. Now, if the crisis ends and he keeps these powers, then that's another story that I don't think he will. But this is one of the things, the, the hypocrisies. Now, what is Hungary's strategy? I mean, Hungary, going back to Horti, had a strategy of complex relationships with many countries. His view was that he was going to be able to have relations with France, relations with Germany, relations with Italy, and find the basis for multiple relationships. It worked for a very long time until it didn't work. And when it didn't work, it didn't work catastrophically. Um, Hungary has to be in this strategy. Hungary, as soon as it locks into a relationship with a country like the United States, is locked in. And the United States may use it as bait for the Russians or who knows what. And Hungary doesn't want that. But the problem that Hungary has is there's no coalition that he can join where he's equal. Visegrad didn't work out that way. Uh, it has to be some sort of coalition with some foreign guarantor who has no real interest. I will not pitch my country. There's no point in going that direction. But I will say this. The Hungarian strategy, national strategy, is predictable. A small nation looking to protect its sovereignty in a world full of sharks. Okay? But you can only be witty so long. At some point, you have to come to rest. I have no idea where he comes to rest. Every time that the prime minister visits Putin, uh, Washington lights up, trying to figure out what it means. And what it means is he went to visit Putin, enjoyed it. Uh, I'm sure the Russians are equally excited when he shows up meeting Trump. What does it mean? So I regard uh, Hungary as providing major employment for the intelligence industry. Because no one can quite figure out what you're doing. And <laughs> That's because no one speaks Hungarian. You are the only exception. And I try to explain to them, the Hungarians necessary are not necessarily doing anything with a purpose. They're doing <laughs> well, actually, what they can. <laughs> uh, actually, I, uh, I really liked your article when you, uh, in, where you wrote about the comparison between the... the current uh, Hungarian strategy and the Hungarian strategy between the two world wars. But I think what we are doing in Hungary is not, not that we are following Horthy, but we are following uh, St. Stephen, our first king, who, who formulated the, uh, the country thousand years ago. Because what happened then? Hungarians... 100 years we have to go. So we're talking about uh, the age of 1,100 years ago. We occupied a basin, it's called the Carpathian Basin, surrounded by mountains. We managed uh, the life uh, there. We provided security for the people. And we created the geopolitical balance. We balanced between the big players, between the Germans, between the Byzantines, between uh, uh, the Catholic Church, so we were able to, to create a balance 1,000 years ago, um, secured the status quo, and we used this peaceful period of time to build a very successful, very strong, and, um, and uh, very modern, back in that days, very modern country, which provided security and prosperity for everybody who was living in, the, in, in, in this Carpathian base. And what is the Hungarian strategy after 1,000 uh, years in a smaller uh, territory? It's pretty much the same. So what we want to achieve is to create a geopolitical balance between us and all the big players. We want to maintain good relationship with everybody and we want to create relations where everybody's interest to have a successful Hungary. And in the last 10 years, we were be able to create this uh, 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 and build this status quo 
And since then, we use this uh, relatively peaceful period of time. Sometimes we have migration crisis, sometimes we had coronavirus, but this relatively peaceful time uh, to, to modernize the state, uh, to uh, bring uh, security and prosperity for the country. So you, you don't have to understand the Hungarians from the 20th century, but you can understand uh, the Hungarians from the from the 10th and 11th century. It's an old story. This makes you a difficult ally. <laughs> it's very hard to work <laughs> with you. But I would point out one other thing. I agree. You are not in the Carpathians anymore. You're in the basin, only the basin. And this is Hungary's long-term strategic necessity, of which we can talk some other time. But I mean, look, the United States now is in alliance with Poland and with Romania, which is not necessarily ideal for you at the moment. At the moment, it's fine, but it's down the road. So the question for me is, I, I see disagree with you, George. I Which disagree one? with you, George, because, because what we learned in the 20th century is that we can have I mean, we, the Central Europeans, or the Central European small nations can have problems if we are in a geopolitical conflict zone. And if we have a geopolitical conflict zone in Central Eastern Europe, then everybody, every nation is affected by that. So the Slovakian nation, the Romanian nation, the Hungarian, the Polish nation, every nation is on the bad side of the story if we have the geopolitical conflict zone in our country. Because if the Russians are here and fighting with the Germans, if the, um, uh, the Islamic civilization is here in the Central Eastern European region, conflicting with the Christian civilization, what we had in the Middle East, then we are in a bad side, on a wrong side of history. So what we have to avoid, what we have to do is to avoid to be, to have a geopolitical conflict zone in our region. And from this perspective, we have to, and that's our only chance, to cooperate with every country, with every neighboring country. And we Hungarians and the Hungarian government, sometimes even our people don't understand why we are doing that, but we're doing that since 10 years. We're desperately looking for channels of cooperation with Romanians, uh, with Serbians, with Slovakians, with the Ukraines, with everybody. And it's not upon us that we are successful in doing that or not successful in doing that because if we had a partner who who understands this necessity and can think about the future from a geopolitical perspective and from the strategic perspective then this strategy works we have a wonderful relation with the serbians in the in the in the last decades it was, it was a horrible relationship all with this historical uh, uh, moments, uh, what you mentioned. But currently, we have wonderful relations. So we can do it if the partner is on board. Sometimes the partner is not on board, but that's our only chance to survive the 21st century. Putting together a coalition in which everybody has options and opting out is sometimes dangerous. So what is needed from my point of view is a coalition. You have problems on both sides that are unpredictable and you're building for 20 years from now. <clears throat> and have it guaranteed by some country that has a marginal interest, but no overwhelming interest. I refer to my country. So the relationship with the United States is important because while we do not want to see the region fall one way or the other, we also have no abiding interest in it. And this is one of the problems of the Hungarians and the Poles and the Romanians. They want us to be very enthusiastic. It's we're not enthusiastic, but we're there. And that makes a big difference. And so I think the question here is not what we're doing now. And this is Hungary has been very tactical. I will say the question of the pacification of the region is not up to, I mean, you face I mean, I'll make up dangers or Germany, Russia, even Turkey could become an interesting power. So your problem is your security is up to them. Now, the question is, how do you build institutions to, to 
to deter them. And that's a long discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Virtue of politics. <laughs> so guys, last question, uh, which is um, more on a personal note. Did you read any really interesting book lately during the crisis uh, well, that you would recommend to the Brain Bar audience? Well, I've been reading books on the Great Depression. And what I'm interested in the Great Depression is what the lives were like. I'm not interested in the finances. I mean, the finances are there. A depression is different from a recession. A recession is a financial event, part of a business cycle, understandable. In a depression, systems break down. Things that were there are no longer there. And the condition for people in the United States is awful, but I was looking at Weimar, Germany. You know, we were in depression in a way, the world, from the end of World War I to 1955. I say that because first, until Hitler took power, there was a terrible depression in Europe. Then after World War II, from China to uh, Britain, Eurasia was in disastrous position. Hungary too. So the thing we have to think about is this. The virus is not really interesting. The consequences of the solution that we found is a contraction of the work so workforce. It is a contraction of the global economy. Germany's problem is that the United States will not be able to buy cars next year. But if the United States is not able to come, we export trouble. When we're in trouble, we export it because we're export. But in all of these countries, there's a history of catastrophic depression. My fear is that in trying to save lives, we'll be ruining a generation. I don't know that that will happen. I don't think that will happen. Hope that won't happen. But what we've drew, done is withdraw the workforce from work and the economies will contract. Everybody sort of thinks somehow in the next couple of months we'll go back to the way we were. Well, you go long enough, you can't go back to the way you were. So what I've been reading about is what was life like there? What was the okay. poverty like there? Bullet? Excuse me? Two, two, but I have two answers. One, uh, I really enjoyed the book uh, what you gave to me, which was about uh, climate change, how in human history there was a, a constant uh, uh, climate change and how humanity or the nations could uh, even uh, uh, positively or negatively react and adapt that. So I think uh, to, un to talk about uh, climate change Uh, from a historical... And this is a book a, called the, the Cultural History of the Climate. Cultural History of the Climate, exactly. I really enjoyed that. And that is another book which is available in English. Um, and it's written by Ivan Krastev, who is a very interesting figure. He is um, a Bulgarian from origin, and uh, he, but he works in, uh, in uh, Austria. And he is a liberal, uh, actually, but... Uh, He is uh, among the very few Central Eastern European uh, uh, talking head or intellectual who has some influence on the West. And uh, he likes to read things about, uh, about uh, our region and tr he tries to explain uh, why we are different. Uh, he is uh, doing a very similar job, what is sometimes... Uh, also also done by George, uh, and he has a new book. Uh, uh, the title is The Light That uh, Failed, and he talks about liberalism, how the liberalism and how the idea of importing uh, political thoughts, principles, uh, solutions from outside failed in this region. And uh, he talks about the thing that... Uh, Every country and everybody on the West has to understand that uh, Central European um, uh, countries, once they want to uh, e reinvent themselves, so they want to 
invent and reinvent uh, their own political, economic and cultural uh, structures. So they don't want to import uh, ideas anymore. They want to find their own way of living. And I think it's a very important message. And this uh, English book should be read by everybody who is who wants to understand this region. And obviously, everybody should uh, uh, read George's books as well. Which yeah, I actually, we have a, actually we have the last question here from Andrea Baldi. George Friedman, after the COVID crisis, does it still make sense to read your new book, which was written <laughs> before the, the crisis? Not only does it make sense, you should buy 15 copies and give it to other people. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I we certainly didn't anticipate this, but in a way it put my forecast on steroids, which is that I said the 2020s would be a time of economic dysfunction and, and we're having it. Now, the question is how deep it goes. So read it now while it still makes sense, then throw it away. Thank you so much, George and Balaj. It was an honor. Thank you so much for the audience. Thank you so much for this enormous amount of questions. Very good questions this time as well. And looking forward to meet you again next week uh, with new content on the Brain Bar channel. Thank you so much and uh, have a good night. Thank you. Take care.